4 avec M. McLean pour 6 minutes. Well, thanks for being here, officials. And I'm going to go back to where I was when I was asking the minister about all the foreign investment that comes in and the value chain that we're trying to build here in Canada for strategic metals that goes into battery processing, that goes into battery manufacturing, that goes into cars at the end of the day. So we are subsidizing now every one of those steps of production. We're subsidizing with flow-through financing, which is a gift for rich people, if you will, at tax time for the actual mines themselves. We're also subsidizing the processing of the mineral with offshore uh, producers sometimes. We're definitely subsidizing offshore uh, manufacturers when we actually build the batteries now, for sure. So we talk about looking at offshore financing as if it's something we should cast an eye upon, and yet at the same time we're writing checks from the Canadian public for every one of these steps in this value chain. Can you tell us what this value chain is actually worth if we have to subsidize foreign companies to come in and do this for Canadians? So first, thank you very much. Within the context of the Investment Canada Act, what we're looking at with the Investment Canada Act is when uh, foreign companies are coming in to set up or purchase uh, or ac acquire Canadian companies. So in that context, that's kind of the scope of what the ICA is looking at. Um, so there are other policies and, and other elements that are looking at um, you know, strategic investments in the value chain that you're referring to, from mines right through to uh, the automotive industry. Um, but the ICA itself isn't going to shape or dictate that value chain. It's, it's actually just going to be looking at when foreign companies come in to set up shop in Canada or acquire a Canadian company, and then it will assess whether that's in Canada's best interest. Well, it, yeah, but at the same time, we're actually parking a whole bunch of Canadians' money into these foreign companies that we choose. The minister wants carte blanche to choose which one he says no to, which I presume means the contrary to that is he's going to choose which one he says yes to uh, as a result of what he's proposing here in this act that's coming forth. So therefore, it is a thumb on the scale of which international companies will get projects subsidized by the Canadian taxpayer in Canada. And right now that happens at the battery production level, at the lithium processing level, at the auto manufacturing level. Now, I want the government to square this for me because frankly, we are putting a whole bunch of bets on this electric vehicles, which have a large investment from Canadian taxpayers into them, and also a large upfront CO2 footprint. This is not going around. Can you see why we're not meeting any of our targets, either for bringing in foreign investment or lowering our CO2 emissions in Canada? So, thank you very much again for the question, Member and Mr. Chair. I guess what I would say, as, as different investment opportunities come forward, they will fall within the purview of the Investment Canada, depending on the nature of those investments and the degree to which they represent a foreign acquisition or foreign company setting up within the context of, of uh, the Canadian borders. And so from that standpoint, um, those companies, when they acquire a Canadian company, for example, will have to notify us, and at that point we'll be looking at that. If it meets certain thresholds, it would fall within the net benefit provisions, and we would look at it through that lens. If it doesn't, we would still be looking at it through a national security lens. Okay, well, I'm not sure that answers the question. So the whole thing is, is take a look at the investments we're making through the SIF, and it is with foreign countries, foreign companies that are investing in Canada. But we have to bribe them, and this is the minister writing checks to these companies. And we're giving them a lot of money, and they walk away with the IP, much like has happened with Medicago and Novavax. But this is on the edge with happening with Rio Tinto, when we're gambling on a new technology for them. It's ArcelorMittal, who's actually gambling on a new steel production. But the IP at the end, even if it doesn't work, it has some advantages that they're walking offshore. So we're not keeping our IP in Canada as a result of these decisions. Can you explain how we're actually protecting Canadian taxpayers' investment in an intellectual property in that respect? So thank you again for the question. I guess, and I'll try again to, to get sort of uh, a, a more defined answer from, from that standpoint. There's multiple tools that are used in these investment periods. So you mentioned the Strategic Innovation Fund, and so the government negotiates with companies around the Strategic Innovation Fund in those kit situations. The Investment Canada Act and the process around the Investment Canada Act is separate and apart from that because some Strategic Innovation Fund investments are relevant and fall within the Investment Canada Act pur purview, and others are not. And so with respect to Bill C-34, those are the pieces we're looking at. Now, you mentioned intellectual property, and I think that's uh, an important element. And, and Mr. Chair, with respect to intellectual property, 
there are a couple of the provisions that I think are particularly important because we've heard um, from various stakeholders the risk associated with intellectual property and the degree to which we may invest in those areas and to, and to the degree to which then we are able to control those. And so... Okay, but have you learned... I'm sorry to interrupt. Have no. you learned from the failures we've had over the last handful of years where the intellectual property has just disappeared with contracts that your, dis your department has written with foreign investors coming into Canada? So I would say in the context of the Strategic Innovation Fund, there are specific clauses associated with intellectual property, um, and those clauses would kick in if uh, the company was to leave the country or if investments were to change. Okay, so let's drill into Metacago in that respect. How has that worked? Because right now, that IP is parked offshore Canada, and we've paid hundreds of millions of dollars for it. So walk me through how we're going to return that investment to Canadian taxpayers. So I'm unfortunately not familiar with the Metacago investment. It's, it's not a piece uh, that I'm familiar with, so unfortunately I can't answer that question. I'm sorry. Thank you very much, Mr. McLean. That's all the time. And just as 